Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining with me on this Wednesday, October 14th, 2020, for Friendship Wesleyan Church's uh, Wednesday evening, 7 p.m. Bible study. I hope you've been having an awesome week filled with God's presence. Hey, I want to get started as quickly as we can. At this point, many of you are aware that we are studying in Romans, and to, tonight we are on the uh, uh, chapter 7, verses 1 through 25, the entire chapter, actually. And uh, this little graphic here says the war within. Um, some call it Paul's explanations of the two natures. Um, I love this. Of course, I love so much of Romans, but, uh, um, and at, you know, at the beginning of our introduction, I explained that without Romans, um, we would be uh, utterly lost in understanding doctrine and, and the positions of the church and on biblical positions. Uh, so, so Romans itself, but uh, chapter seven, which leads us into a, a really powerful chapter, chapter eight, um, that we'll be tackling next week. Um, but uh, this explanation of the battle, the flesh with the spirit, um, is incredible. So we are, uh, we're going to begin there uh, this evening. Um, I'm going to start with a word of prayer. I'm going to do what I had done in other weeks, which is we'll be reading the text as we study the text. So let's have a word of prayer. Father, we come to you tonight. As always, we ask you to guide and direct us in your word. We're grateful, Lord. I, th I think maybe, Father, the thing I think tonight is that we would be honest with ourselves as we as we read through uh, the Apostle Paul's incredible transparency about his own uh, wrestle with the flesh and the carnal nature. And uh, so, Father, may we, because it leads to humility, to know where we've come from, what we've been saved from, and fully understand the, the whole good news, the, the full uh, what you intended and what you did through your son, Jesus, in our lives, Father. And so guide and lead us in your word tonight through your spirit. May it not just be ink on paper, but alive and, uh, and cutting to the marrow of the bone in our lives. We pray all this tonight in Jesus' precious, wonderful name. Amen. So um, let's let's uh, just grab uh, chapter 7. Let me read uh, verses 1 through 3 is where I want to start. So, do you not know, brothers and sisters, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law has authority over someone only as long as that person lives. For example, by law, a married woman is bound to her husband as long as he is alive, but if her husband dies, she is released from the law that binds her to him. So then, if she has sexual relations with another man while her husband is still alive, she is called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is released from that law and is not an adulteress if she marries another man. Now, notice I tried to make emphasis as I read the number of places that the word law is used. We've talked about this coming into this chapter, but uh, the number of times, and I, I underlined just through uh, verse 6, and so it, I'll read real quick, law, 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 that law, 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 law. That's all just in uh, down through uh, verse 6. I think I said chapter 6 a minute ago, but down through... Uh, uh, verse 6. So to understand what Paul is saying here in these first three verses, I think the thing that comes to mind for me is, you know, in life, uh, if we are freed from all obligations and contracts when we die, right? So Paul's um, illustration is going to be that uh, it's the same with the obligation to the law, and now we'll go over law again in just a moment to make sure we understand. But when we die with Christ, and Paul has already told us back in chapter 6. Well, I meant to you, grab your Bibles. So um, hopefully you're, you already have them there and you're turning back with me chapter 6. And then you look at uh, verses 3 and 4. Uh, listen to what Paul says here. 
Uh, we are those, verse two, who have died to sin, verse two, how can we live any longer? Verse three now, or don't you know that all of us were baptized in Christ Jesus, who were baptized in Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death. We who were therefore buried with him through baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. So, um, but Paul's talking about in these first three verses of chapter seven, you know, de physical death, and then the obligations that, uh, that freed us from, uh, once again, as an illustration, it also frees us from the obligation to the, the law. Remember, the law was a good thing. It wasn't a, a bad thing, but the law could not save us. So now let's pause it, it, just for a moment, make sure we understand the law, right? Um, you know, I explained a couple of weeks ago, I think it was two weeks ago, that the law really here is referring to what we would call the Mosaic law, the law of Moses. Basically, the first five books of the Old Testament, often called the Pentateuch, the Torah. Um, I, I like it. Matter of fact, at least one translation uses the phrase here um, for law, the written law. Uh, the, the laws that Moses recorded, once again, those first five books of the Bible. But I found something interesting in verse one. You, you would have noticed it because it's kind of hidden, but uh, let me read verse one for you again and then explain to you what, what I found here. But uh, do you not know, brothers and sisters, for I'm speaking to those who know the law, that the law has authority over some, someone only as long as that person lives. So it's in the article that is uh, in this sentence, uh, at least one of the articles. Uh, you know, when I say article, I'm talking about you know, grammar. Uh, I learned so much more about my English grammar by learning a second language when we were in Brazil and I learned Portuguese. Articles in Portuguese are so important because unlike English, they're masculine and fem feminine. You have to match them to the noun. But it's what comes before the noun, usually the the or the a or an. So in this verse, it would be the first article for law. I'm speaking to those who know the law. So look at this in Greek. Um, I've shared this before, at least in-house on Wednesday nights. Um, the, I'll, I'll do a snippet like this, if you will, where uh, in from my study on the website I go to. So you get an English kind of, you've got the Greek, the way it would be set up in grammar, sentence structure in Greek, and then an attempt in English to, uh, you know, use the word in English and in the order that would be in the Greek. So this verse, or are you ignorant brothers to those knowing for law? Notice there's, there's no article. I speak that the law. As a matter of fact, what I found is that translations actually try to deal with this. So the, the Holman Christian Standard Bible, HCSB here, says, uh, since I am speaking to those who understand law, not the law, but law. Brothers, are you unaware that the law has authority over someone as long as he lives? And then the good news translation, paraphrase, certainly you will understand what I'm about to say, my friends, because all of you know about law. The law rules over people only as they, notice the law here, right? And then finally, I thought this was interesting in the Berean literal Bible. I spelled that out for you because I'm unfamiliar with the translation, but or, uh, here we go, or are you ignorant brothers, for I speak, notice it's in parentheses, for I speak to those knowing, and the word, or the article, the, is italicized, law, uh, to let their readers know that that it, it does not need to be there. For English, it needs to be there to read appropriately, but uh, it wasn't there in Greek that the law rules over the, the, the man for as long as the time he is uh, alive. And so um, I, I just found it interesting. It's such a small thing. And I try to pause on these things sometimes to show you how digging deeper will reveal some incredible things 
um, about God's word. But I think the thing it does here is in one sense, you're saying the law, meaning a, a narrow specific of the Mosaic law or the written word or whatever. And here, I think that Paul's really saying, hey, you all who understand law, and he's speaking more in general, giving them credit for, for being intelligent, for knowing about the written law, and then uh, the, the nature around that and how the law works. So, but I don't want to hang out on that uh, too long. So let's, uh, let's move on from there. Um, yep, let me come back to full screen. And I think, uh, you know, Paul's point here is that uh, we're not under the obligation. He uses, you know, marriage and death and, and being released from the, the, uh, uh, the marriage uh, covenant um, because one spouse has died. I think he's, we're not under obligation uh, to the law when we've died with Christ. So, so remember, we are freed uh, from the obligation law, but Paul and Jesus, I want to make sure we don't, we, we don't uh, misinterpret, misunderstand here, that Paul and Jesus were not throwing the law out. They weren't saying that the law hadn't been any good, that the law wasn't good, that, you know, they weren't even saying like, don't obey the law, right? They were just, we were free from the obligation of the law. We're, and I'm going to use this with a small s. So while we don't have to follow all the regulations of the law, I'll get to some, some examples of that in a moment, we're still under the spirit of the law. This has helped me to understand so many people are like the Old Testament, uh, you know, isn't valid today because, you know, the, the new covenant in Christ, the Old Testament was the old covenant, so there's nothing valid for us in the Old Testament. Matter of fact, there's some, some I, I've heard all kinds of explanations about today's sins that we have in the world and how what the Old Testament says about those things don't apply. And I just, when you understand this, how you in, interpret from the Old Testament and being under the spirit of the law, not throwing the law out, but understanding we're not under the obligation of the law, um, it helps to, to, to know that the whole Bible, the Old and New Testament are are important for our lives in Christ. Um, so uh, the, I said about examples. For, for example, in the Old Testament, uh, I won't give you specific references, but in Leviticus and Deuteronomy, uh, there were laws, regulations about certain wool blends. And they were, depending on the translation, it'll say linen with wool, and it was prohibited. Um, homes, uh, with mold were uh, destroyed, um, and and on and on and on. Uh, you probably maybe have heard some of them yourself and thought, wow, that's kind of crazy. You wonder why they did that. By the way, I'll say this, any of those crazy things, did you wonder why they were done? You go back and check, and you'll find out there was good in them. It was for the good of the community, for health, uh, for uh, very important reasons. So we're released from the obligation to the particular practice of the law, but the character of the law was never bad. Matter of fact, I mentioned things like they were there for the, 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 the Israelites' health, for the people's, um, the good of the community, um, for, for good reasons. And so, and then I think of Paul, who already in chapter 3, verse 20, has told us the good of the law to reveal to us, to make us conscious to wrong. And then in this same chapter, chapter 7, verse 7, jump down there, he says, what shall we say then? Is the law sinful? Certainly not. Nevertheless, I would not have known what sin was had I not had it not been for the law. For I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said, you shall not covet. Um, pretty simple, right? So, you know, Paul making it clear that we're not throwing the law out here. It, it was good. That's, that's not what we're doing here. I think of Jesus, in a uh, matter of fact, I think I have a, a slide here uh, for us with words of Jesus from Matthew chapter 5. Let me bring it up here. Yeah. Words of Jesus, Matthew chapter 5, who was... Uh, uh, who who addressed this this issue, right? 
Let me read what he says here. Do not think that I've come to ab abolish the law or the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to the fulfill them. For truly, I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore, anyone sets aside one of, sets aside one of the least of these commands, teaches others accordingly, will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. By the way, that's what I want to say is, is people today who use, well, you know, the Old Testament, that's gone, that's out of this. This, Jesus was coming against that, us doing that, right? Um, the, uh, the least of these commands teaches others, according will be called least in the kingdom of heaven, but whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees, the teacher of the law, the re religious leaders, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. So Paul and Jesus both made it clear that in um, teaching the our you know, not having an obligation to the letter of the law anymore, uh, that they weren't throwing out the character and the spirit of the law. And, and I've, I really believe, I've said this to people, you can take any of that stuff from the Old Testament and I can show you how it's a character quality of God throughout the Old Testament, then into the New Testament, and Christian living is affected by it even to this day. Um, and so anything from the Old Testament, any, any of those laws, while we don't practice them, um, uh, the, the, uh, legalistically or by the, by the letter of the law, the spirit of the law is still there. So I, um, I made a note here. It isn't that the law was bad. It couldn't save us because the point is the law couldn't save us, right? Because nobody can fully follow the law because of our sinfulness. It's one of the things that, that Paul is making clear here. So I tried to, to think of what would be a parallel today because um, we don't, that Mosaic law, most of us don't, um, the Jews would, but most of us wouldn't uh, go to the Old Testament and go, okay, um, uh, wool blends and how do I follow that rule and law? Um, of course, we uh, adhere clearly to the Ten Commandments and um, the and then once again the character of the other laws. But we we don't. So what you know? How is it? What would be for us today the a parallel of following the law and and acting like we're under obligation wrongly so and missing the whole point of the good news of Jesus which uh, one of Paul's point here is to to understand the whole good news of Christ and that the law cannot save us and we were not obligated to all you know to the regulations of the law so and i think the bible uh, today is a great example and what, and what i want to say about that is the bible can't save you well, and what I mean by that is the, the ink and the pages, <laughs> the, because that's what it is, right? It, it's ink and it's pages, and, uh, and, and it's, it would be easy to know the Bible um, and yet not be in relationship to God. I think the Bible leads people to truth, and I'm, and I'm not um, uh, saying that there isn't the, that God doesn't use His word. His word is profound, but uh, God's in His word, and that's what makes it. Um, but it, here's the deal: is people uh, to try to make it easier to understand. Um, the Bible can lead you to salvation, but it in and of itself can't save you. And a lot of uh, people who know the Bible don't know the God of the Bible. Now, that's hard to comprehend, but it's true. It is, um, and remember that Paul was a Pharisee. Paul was a, uh, a, a teacher of the law. So he, he knows what he's talking about. And Paul knew the scriptures um, as much or more than anybody, right? And so, so Paul's saying, you, um, I know what I'm talking about. The law can't save you. And when we die with Christ, we're not under that kind of obligation to the law, and it happens. It happens today. Jesus addressed it in John chapter five. He said pretty much the same thing 
39 through 40, verses 39 through 40, he was addressing the religious leaders, right? And he says, you study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. You see what Jesus was saying? He was saying, you guys know the scripture. You've got them memorized. Some of the religious leaders, they wore a box on their head that had scripture in it. And, uh, and Jesus was saying, but you do not know the God of the scriptures. And so that, that kind of, uh, and I think we have plenty of that um, in the, the church today. And uh, so I think it's that kind of parallel with the law of the Old Testament, where it would be easy for us to be legalistic about um, even the text of Scripture, but not know the God of Scripture. And, and Paul, what he's pushing us to is knowing and being in relationship. Matter of fact, one of the things I wanted to say here is this is really what in, in the church a lot of times we'll say, uh, it's about relationship, not religion. Um, and I don't mind the word religion in a lot of context, but what we're talking about here, it would be easy to have religion and not have a relationship with God. And a lot, as a matter of fact, I think our human nature is one to practice religion without the inconvenience of being in relationship with a God who's given us daily, daily guidance and direction and uh, and knows what's best for our life. So, um, so just a just a thought about what the, the deeper kind of what I think Paul's trying to get at here with the law, because it almost sounds like he's he's throwing it out and he's not. And we've studied that already. So verses. Then let's jump down to verses seven through uh, seven through twelve. Like I'm, it's not going to be possible for me to read every verse, but let's. Let's let me read some of this text for you now. So Paul says, you know, with that in mind, what shall we say then? Is the law sinful? And here he's going to say what I'm saying. Certainly not. Nevertheless, I would not have known what sin was had it not been for the law, for I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said you shall not covet. But sin seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment produced in me every kind of coveting. For apart from the law, sin was dead. Once I was alive, alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin sprang to life and I died. I found that the very commandment that was intended to bring life actually brought death. For sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, deceived me through the commandment, put me to death, and through the commandment, put me to death. So then the law is holy and the commandment is holy, righteous and good. And I think I'll, I think I'll pause there. Um, cause if you, you're listening to that, Paul's basically saying, and the law actually makes it worse. It, it made it worse because there is no grace and mercy in the law. The law is the law and the law gives us a conscious understanding of right and wrong. The more you understand how sinful you are, the worse the condition becomes. Because then we're aware of our sinfulness, we're still sinful, and the judgment of the law was punishment for being sinful, was punishment with death, right? In verse, uh, in verse 10, Paul says, I found that the very commandment that was intended, um, I think I have it, uh, I think I have a slide here for us. Let's see here. Yeah, there we go. I found that the very commandment that was intended to bring life actually uh, brought death, intended to bring life. It was intended to bring health, to show us the right way. It was good to give us a conscience about the difference between right and wrong, but I'm a sinner and cannot fully obey it. So it shows me to be a sinner. The punishment of that, of, of being a, you know, a sinner is eternal death. Is, is it making sense? Paul's like, man, the condition here gets worse. Um, and then in uh, verses 13 and 14, he said, did that which is good then become death to me? By no means. Nevertheless, in order that sin might be recognized as sin, it, it used what is good to bring about my death so that through the commandment, sin might become utterly sinful. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. 
now this this begs a uh, really big question, but I wanted to do something here uh, real quick with uh, with verse 14. So in verse 14, Paul says, um, we know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual. It almost, it almost sounds like Paul is um, totally distancing himself from a, a spiritual life, the, the, the new creature that he, had, that he talks about, the new creation. Um, and and he's, he's like, it almost sounds like a losing story here, right? I am unspiritual, sold as a slave. Uh, to sin. If you look at various translations, you'll see that word for unspiritual is used in multiple ways. I didn't even capture them all here, but uh, the flesh, carnal, human, mortal, and so all these, these different ways. Matter of fact, the New Living Translation, this is really good. The New Living Translation says, so the trouble is not with the law, for it is spiritual and good. The trouble is with me, for I am all to human, a slave to sin. So this kind of begs a question that I've uh, thought about um, over the years of ministry, and people have asked me about, and I hear people talk about, and actually it's got a larger context of worldview in our culture and all. Are, in, are people, humans, inherently good or bad? I mean, we and maybe one of the things we think of, we see, we think of newborn little babies, and and we're, you know, it's at that stage of life that we're very inclined to go, wow, you know, babies, they're so cute, they're so beautiful, um, they're so good, you know, they don't do anything wrong, they're they're so good, they're inherently good, um, and then we kind of we leapfrog from that into so we're all good. So listen to me, here's the way I understand it from the scripture. And that is, um, we are good because of the value that God places on us. You know, in all of creation, it was said of humans when God breathed into Adam, the breath of life, um, he had used good for the rest of creation. And then he used very good for the creation of, of man. And so the value that God gives us and the value that caused God to send, to send his son to die for us. Um, it, and and I've, I've told people, if you want to understand how to like uh, love other people and see humanity in a little bit different way than the anger and hurt and hate and bitterness that can come up from being a relationship to other people, you have to value them the way that God sees them, creation, right? However, there's bad news here because the scriptures really point at us as inherently bad. So our value is good and God places a, a value on humans above creation. Um, but our, our, because of original sin, because of sin, the sin of Adam and ours, we're inherently bad. And what I say is, uh, do you have to teach those cute little babies as they grow to do good or to do bad? Do they naturally know how to do bad, we do bad so easily. And we, we it, when it comes to worldview, we need to understand that because you, you don't understand as a parent your responsibility to teach uh, your children the difference between right and wrong and that you, that you need to teach them um, when their actions are bad and wrong and sinful, right? And, uh, and so um, I would say that our value is very good, but we're inherently bad and you don't have to teach anybody how to sin and to do wrong. So now 15 to 25, which is my favorite portion of this text. Uh, let me read some of it for you. I do not understand what I do for what I want to do. I do not do, but what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, it is sin living in me that does it. And let me just point out that, that Paul sounding like this is a losing story is growing here, right? So he can't even do good if he wants to do it. And he almost sounds like he's casting blame, like, it's not me. 
I don't even know it. It's sin that's living in me. Verse 21, so I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind, making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. And he concludes it with this, what a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Wow. Um, that, you see what I'm saying? Uh, and I know I haven't gotten to the next verse yet. We'll do that in just a moment. But Paul, is, he, he restates the condition, right, that we're under being in the body and the flesh, the, the carnal and the, the inability of the law uh, to save us. And so the law teaches me right and wrong, and I'm, and I'm brought into this situation where I come, become fully aware of my brokenness, sinfulness. I try harder and harder by the law to be a good person, and the worse my condition becomes. We can't do this ourselves. We can't, right? And, uh, and I thought, I don't want to put a bunch of time here. This, this isn't, this is talking about in a spiritual world and, and understanding God and everything else, because I don't want anybody to think that people who don't know God can't do good stuff. We're, we're not saying that at all. Matter of fact, I would say that good that's done often in the world, you just, you're seeing the creation, the design of God and people who don't know God who can do good. So this, um, staying away from that conversation and trying to stay on this one, with what Paul's teaching us um, biblically about our condition in relationship to sin. And uh, so the, the, the law reveals, and then I become, my condition becomes worse. And so uh, I'm, I have here in the notes like a third time, Paul really sounds like he's losing here and shrinking from responsibility. And Paul isn't shrinking from responsibility. Um, and, and remember, this isn't just Paul's condition. This is the, the condition, our condition, right? And in verse 18, I think Paul gives us a clue. Verse, verse 18, Paul says, For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. And this is where you'll hear people say that Paul's explaining the two natures, right? Um, that, and I'm not sure I totally... Uh, agree in this sense, but it, it helps to understand a little bit better. But um, so Paul is saying in his uh, sinful nature, in the flesh, in the body, um, that he's unable to do uh, what is good. And uh, remember that Paul has already said that this doesn't mean we cannot live in victory over sin. That, that, that came already. We, we studied that, right? He's simply stating the severity of the human condition and our battle with the flesh. Even as followers of Christ, we live in the body and there's a battle with the flesh. Um, that's why I think last week's study on holiness and sanctification is so important to, to understand that I'm, I'm learning and I'm on the journey right now of learning from God uh, about the, you know, the victory that I can have over sin. Um, and so our, our, Paul's also describing our inability to gain eternal life and to do anything eternal without Christ. And so this brings me to the conclusion of the matter. And I think 24 and 25 are the conclusion of the matter. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body of, that is subject to death? And so ver verse, verse 25 is the answer to that question. So I didn't read it earlier. Let's see. I think I have uh, got to have this one on our, uh, on our screen for us, right? Let me move to the next slide. Yep, here's verse 25, the answer. Let me read 24 again to so put it in context. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Verse 25, thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Who delivers me through Jesus Christ, my Lord. This is interesting, and I think a place where we can wrap it up, but most other translations, if you look at other translations, this is the New International Version, but if you look at most other translations, this delivers me, it's pretty non-existent. 
Um, the NIV, I think, used it to bring clarification to what's being said here, because it sounds like a losing story. It sounds like Paul is casting blame, but it was all to get here. No, we don't have an obligation to the rigidity of the law, but through the Holy Spirit and with Jesus Christ, because we have died to him, while we don't have an obligation, through Jesus, we receive eternal life, um, uh, forgiveness for our sins, and we receive in, in our life and our body here, the victory that comes through Jesus. And this word that's key here is this word through, because what I found out is while delivers me isn't in any other translation, I think, most of them do have this word through. And the reason why is because it is there in the Greek, but this word is what's key. Um, and in some ways, these three words kind of define this one word in the Greek. So here it is. Um, it looks like a word that I learned in Portuguese year, years ago, dia, um, but actually I, I, it's not connected to that in the Latin. But this word dia, properly across to the other side, back and forth to go all the way through, successfully across, thoroughly also commonly used as a prefix and lend the same idea thoroughly, literally, successfully across to the other side. So this picture that Paul has painted of um, uh, the, the, our brokenness in the flesh, this battle we have with sin, and it seems like it's nothing but a lost battle all the time, and, and the insufficiency of the law to help us, there's no grace and mercy. The law even makes it worse, and it brings condemnation because I am a sinner. Who will rescue me? And then let me paraphrase. Paul says, Jesus, who takes us to the other side, the spiritual life with a capital S in Christ. Man, what what powerful stuff! Something for us to contemplate. But that's that's uh, that's it for uh, today. Chapter seven, we've just about covered the whole thing. So let me close this in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you. Wow, your word. Um, in some ways, Father, we've probably everybody viewing this evening has had moments of maybe feeling like I can't win this battle. I'm in this body. I'm in this flesh. My mind thinks things it shouldn't. I end up doing things I don't want to. Father, we're so grateful that you inspired Paul to put those words right here in Romans. And we read that and go, yeah, yeah, I know what that's like. But he didn't leave us there, Father. He poses that question. What a wretched man I am who will rescue me. And then a word is placed in there, meaning that Jesus is the one that takes us to the other side, eternal life and forgiveness victory over sin here. Father, empower each person listening, in particular, if they're thinking of places of failure and loss in their life, that, Father, you want to come in and bring healing and wholeness to their lives. Father, we're grateful for your love for us. Give us a spirit-filled rest to our week. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, thank you for joining with me on the online version. Just another reminder that we're in-house on Wednesday nights at seven o'clock as well, if you're in this area. I know there's some people who listen from even way out of state, but um, otherwise um, I will see you Sunday morning, 9.30 and 11 o'clock online or in-house, same on Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. Hey, God bless.